the further we get into any conversation about autism, the easier it is for us to recognize just how prevalent it is in yes, society today. It is. We need to get information out as quickly as possible because yeah. we want everybody to thrive yeah. with autism. Hello again, everybody. This is Craig Evans of Autism Hangout, and thank you for tuning in to this next episode of the Ask Dr. Tony Question and Answer Series, where Dr. Tony Atwood answers your questions about autism and Asperger's. Hello, Dr. T. <laughs> Hello, Craig. Good to see you again. We are in Dallas today because just yesterday we introduced our new book called Ask Dr. Tony. Yes, and, and can I do a quick plug? Yes. I, I think it's behind me there. It's, it's a great book and two great authors, I think. So please buy it, uh, buy lots of copies. Christmas is coming up. So many people have appreciated you giving answers to their specific questions. Now we have actually put in a hard copy answers to the most common questions about autism from parents, teachers, public officials, social workers. Some of the people who uh, sent in questions. Your question may well be in the book. It's a good book to just dip into. Yes. Yeah. All right. Now, people have submitted questions over the past year, and I have come up with 10 of them that fall into several categories. So let's start with anxiety, since that mm. seems to be a prevalent problem. My anxiety occurs when I'm dealing with people. Any small amount of stress triggers me, which then heightens my sensory problems. I feel my anxiety in my body, my back, and my shoulders, and the pain doesn't go away until I can get away from the most stressful situation. I feel bogged down, and I'm starting to feel depressed. So my question is, where do I start? Ooh, what a good question. I think the anxiety associated with people comes in part from performance anxiety. And you've got to think very hard of what to do to read the signals, etc. So often there can be not wanting to make a, a mistake, but another can be a concern with past experiences, of, especially with new people, not knowing whether they're going to be friendly or not. So you are under a lot of stress. You are being observed. You are being evaluated. And many with ASD really do have a sensitivity to being judged and that's how you feel. So no wonder that's occurring. Mm -hmm. Now the question is what do you do in that situation? What we're looking for is a degree of confidence that if you do make a mistake then it's not necessarily a disaster. You need reassurance. Neurotypicals usually reassure each other with nods and smiles and things like that. You're on track. Mm -hmm. And the person with ASD needs to look for that and if it's not there to just seek clarification. People with Asperger's often have incredible intellect as it relates to some special interests. So again, in a social situation, if they start talking about a special interest, how can they again determine how long they should talk about it before it becomes a monologue? Good point. <laughs> One of the difficulties is once the person with ASD is involved in their special interest, time disappears. Uh, and as far as they're concerned, I have a lot to say, and I'm enthusiastic, and I'm enjoying, and this is fun, and I'm educating others. Uh, and that time perception means that you don't have an internal alarm clock that goes off every so often. So it is very much trying to remember that not everyone is as excited by this, and every so often to say, uh, is this boring you or have I said enough or this is very exciting for me but may not be for you should we switch topics at that stage so you need clarification and affirmation from the other person another factor to be careful of is in your enthusiasm you may be looking at the floor looking all over um, wherever you may look does not give you the cues for neurotypicals it's in their face and it's often in their face and body language where they may move into this position. So it's looking for the various signals that indicate closure, which can be folded arms, uh, a look on the face with the eyebrows. So talk to someone you know about what are the signals to indicate this is over. It's also a question of making the interactions fairly brief. It's learning how to end 
the interaction. Mm -hmm. So it may be, oh, sorry, ah, I've got to go for an appointment, or great talking to you, I need to go. Mm -hmm. So you need closure. But afterwards, there can be the issue of ruminating over uh, performance analysis, a social autopsy. How did I perform? <laughs> did I read the signals right and so on? Yeah. And I would say, look, neurotypicals don't do it perfect every time anyway. So just do the best that you can. Mm -hmm. Here's another question about anxiety. Our 25-year-old son has severe anxiety and panic attacks that look like he's having a seizure or a stroke. During a recent attack, we made the mistake of touching him. He didn't know who we were or who he was, and we were injured. I have always viewed his Aspie mind as a strength, but instead of hospitalizing him, he has now been charged with felonies and sent to jail. But he is a kind person. He was actually on two board of directors for local organizations. And now he is at home and he's broken down. Is there more that we can do for the criminal justice system to help them understand our son? This is a, a topic very sensitive to me for a variety of reasons. And I never thought that I would be involved in the criminal justice system in the way that I have with my son. My son has ASD, and when he was a teenager, he explored drugs for a variety of reasons, but one was to manage his anxiety, another was to join a club or a, a group of people. And he explored a whole range of drugs, which are expensive, and that led to armed robbery, uh, court, sent to prison for two years. He's just written a book to help those with ASD cope with prison. So if you're interested, Will Atwood, published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers, and it's how to help those with ASD in jail. Mm -hmm. And it's quite harrowing from a father's perspective to discover some of the situations that are occurring as an alternative culture. Now, uh, when Will was in prison, he spotted other prisoners with ASD. In fact, another prisoner came up to him and said, Will, have you got autism or something? <laughs> and he said, yes, I have. And the other guy said, yes, yeah, so do I. And then he said, my name's Will Atwood. And he said, oh, yeah, your father diagnosed me <laughs> all those years ago. Um, but the research suggests that 5%, 1 in 20 of those in prison have an autism spectrum disorder for a wide variety of offences. Interestingly, Will and I recently did a presentation uh, to a group of people from the criminal justice system in another state. And I talked about how to identify ASD in probation, parole, and in the prison setting, but also Will to describe what it was like from his perspective. Mm -hmm. For example, he would be at a table and there would be the alpha male of that group, very vicious in a variety of ways. And he noticed that there was another prisoner, not very bright, who could have banter and interaction with this person. It was okay. But when Will tried to do that, it didn't work. This person, who was not as smart as Will, knew the barriers, knew to not cross the line and where the line was. He didn't see the line and then got into trouble with that. So I do think there needs to be a recognition because certain uh, rehabilitation programs may or may not work. And that's where I think prison officers need to be aware of the different style of approach. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the person has their first diagnosis by a prison psychologist who's referred someone who's not fitting into the system. All sorts of concerns are being brought to the attention of the prison services and they're referred to the psychologist. And the first time when looking at developmental history and characteristics, mm -hmm. the more knowledge there is, then it's going to make prison less of a traumatic experience. And for many, unfortunately, it has been incredibly traumatic. And I've had to deal with almost PTSD consequences. So there really isn't anything at this point in time that would help rehabilitate our children or assist our children that are caught up in the criminal justice system. It's just basically to say there's a likelihood that you have ASD. I think once such individuals have been identified, what prisons may seriously consider is a unit for those with ASD. 
to create an ASD friendly environment. And I think that is worth considering because if you have a prison population of many hundreds, a thousand or two, then if we think of the number of those with ASD, it's worthy to have a unit which not only is ASD friendly, but also the prison officers themselves are knowledgeable in this area and can make it ASD friendly. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a topic that the prison services need to consider. So if we have somebody in the audience that's associated with the prison, prison or criminal justice system, this is a suggestion that would really aid the people that are in there caught in that trap. The next is managing and keeping friends. Hi, Dr. T. I have a 17-year-old son who's an Aspie, though we also think he might have BPD. He recently had a dramatic breakdown with a group of friends who already knew about his Asperger's. But he's since become very nihilistic, angry, and he deliberately lashes out at people. When asked about that behavior, he says, what's the point of being nice? It doesn't work. I'm not sure how best to help him. Do you have any advice? Okay. First of all, BPD, borderline personality disorder, can occur with autism spectrum disorder. What it means is that the person is often highly motivated to socialize, very keen, almost extrovert, in uh, wanting to achieve successful friendships. But another characteristic is intense despair when things go wrong. And when it doesn't work, it is absolutely catastrophic for that person. The, uh, I might as well kill myself, I'll never succeed. And you get a dramatic reaction. But it is going to take time to recover and for the mood to stabilize. So first of all, with this parent, uh, if you can, be patient. At the moment, your son may say, no, I don't want any friends, I'm not, just leave them be. And eventually, friendships may occur. But it's also important not to over-focus on one or two people. It does mean to diversify so that if one or two friendships end, you have other friendships. Mm -hmm. So that may, in the future, be a learning opportunity to say, broaden your friendship base. Mm -hmm. The next two questions are about Dr. Hans Asperger. Oh. Dear Tony, where do you stand on the latest revelation that Hans Asperger worked for the Nazi Germans in his study of people on the spectrum, sending only those he deemed very disabled to their death? So that's clearly somebody that wants to know where Hans might have stood on this. And the second one is, regarding Dr. Asperger, was he a victim or a perpetrator of his time? Mm -hmm. My introduction to Hans Asperger uh, via Lorna Wing was in relation to his descriptions of what he called autism. And it was a description of four boys in particular. And I was impressed not only with his observation and analysis of what they were doing, but very much his heart and compassion and support and understanding them. His descriptions of the children are excellent. He was their champion and hero. And I would imagine he would talk to parents, helping them understand, as much as I would do, uh, why their son, predominantly, is different and be very supportive. Now, he was a pediatrician in Austria. And I have met his daughter, Maria. And she gave me a document, which was an article that he published in 1938 at the time when the Nazis came into Austria. And that article very much argued against the policy of sending those who were deemed unproductive to basically be killed. And he said, no, this is wrong. You can't do that. And I was thinking, wow, that's a brave man. That's a Gestapo comes around and takes you away sort of thing. I was in Vienna. Uh, this year and obviously this was a major topic of conversation as they had discovered for the first time the notes of the center where those who were severely disabled were sent. The difficulty that Hans Asperger would have experienced was that as a pediatrician if he didn't report that disability it was a criminal offense. I don't know what I would have done in that situation as a pediatrician when you have a child with Down syndrome or severe cerebral palsy, which is very conspicuous, mm -hmm. if you don't say that, 
then it's going to be found out because there were people who would tell on their neighbours if they had a disabled child and then get extra points from the Gestapo. So it was a, a, a real dilemma as what to do. If he didn't, then the chances are that's potentially the end of his life. Mm -hmm. If he did, it's the end of their life. Mm -hmm. And the moral dilemma in that situation is horrifying. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to note a number of points. Number one is he was never a member of the Nazi party and they had copious notes of who was a member and not. Uh, all other medical staff at the hospital were members of the Nazi party. He wasn't. And at the end of the war, the hospital, the children's hospital, only allowed one doctor to return after the war, Hans Asperger. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting that he resigned from his post in 1943 to work in a field hospital. And I think he felt that he couldn't do this any longer. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to actually save people in the field hospital. So my view is he was an amazing man. In history's term, let's remember his positive and incredibly positive descriptions, not the policies of the politicians at the time. Here's a familiar subject, hmm. faking it. Huh? Hello, Dr. Tony. I am a 48-year-old female from Germany. Hmm. My question is, are undiagnosed female Aspies who have developed chameleon-like skills to cope with situations, especially social situations, are they aware they are doing so? I have been suspectedly diagnosed with ASD, but before, I was never aware of faking a lot of social situations. It just more or less feels natural to me. Hmm. What an interesting question. <laughs> I'm going to refer back to my son, Will, again. And in talking to Will about social, um, he said, but doesn't everyone learn socializing by watching and copying? And I said, no. Some people just intuitively know what to do. He said, really? I thought everyone did that. <laughs> and I have a colleague uh, who's just about to start her PhD in University College London in how does the camouflaging, the copying, begin. What happens? I think it's a natural process. It's a coping mechanism. Uh, you're a bit confused. You're not sure what to do. So you watch. And then you notice patterns. And you watch people who are good at it. Right. Okay. I'll watch a mentor. I'll watch somebody who's good. A girl who's popular. Right. That's what I want to be. How does she move? And I recently talked to a mum who was in the back of her class with her daughter in an elementary school. And her daughter was just in front of her, but had her back to her mother. Her daughter was watching a child at the front of the class who was very, very popular, but was using a range of gestures in the interaction. And she watched as her daughter actually copied the actions as she was watching her to make sure they were absolutely right. So I see this as a very intelligent way of coping, but it may delay diagnosis and the true self may not come through. Mm -hmm. And there's a lovely quote, I think, from Maya Tode, that those who do this should be given an Oscar every day for acting neurotypical. Mm -hmm. Plus it's exhausting. <laughs> and depressing. It's a superficial social, social ability. Here's another question about living with autism. Hello, I have heard that a high percentage of people with ASD, or people on the spectrum, suffer from circadian sleep disorders. Can you confirm that? And if so, can you describe the symptoms and how to handle them? Mm. Sleep, big issue. Strangely enough, it's one of the things we look for in the early diagnosis of incredibly young children, is the sleep pattern. Mm -hmm. They're either like a koala and they sleep 16 hours a day, or they hardly sleep at all. In ASD, there's often the two extremes. So it may well be that from infancy, right through that person's life, sleep has been a problem. Mm -hmm. Research has shown that the average length of time for a neurotypical to fall asleep, 15 minutes. Average for ASD, 45 minutes. So there is something about relaxing and going to sleep. One of the issues is to be calm, and many with ASD find it very difficult to actually relax. So there may be 
suggestions of yoga, meditation, eye rest, and things like that to help that person rest, to fall asleep. But once asleep, when you do what's called sleep architecture, that is, what activities are occurring in the brain, the architecture is different. Sometimes to fall asleep, a chemical called melatonin, a prescription, can help fall asleep, but it won't deal with the problems of the duration, depth, and quality of sleep. There are at least five stages in sleep, stages one to four, and REM sleep. And so a sleep clinic, which may be a worthwhile referral for someone with sleep clinics, may look at the proportion of sleep. One thing I would recommend that is very cheap and easy to do are the new sports devices, which actually measure sleep. Mm -hmm. And then you have data of how much sleep you actually had. How often did you wake up? And when you woke up, often those with ASD can't get back to sleep. Neurotypicals, it's on, off, gone again. And they sleep soundly as far as they're concerned. They woke a number of times, but they can't remember it. But there can also be issues of the intensity of the emotions. And a lot of dreams are anxiety-based. And if you've got someone who's very anxious, you're going to have a number of nightmares. And you want to wake up to escape the nightmare. Mm -hmm. And so many of those with ASD are chronically sleep-deprived. Mm -hmm. For young kids, sleep deprivation actually leads to hyperactivity, not necessarily sleepiness. It also means that your ability to focus, your emotional stability is going to be affected. Um, it also is affected when you have depression. So for many with ASD, one of the first questions I ask is, how sleep? Many say, a uh, bit of a problem. And that's when a sleep clinic, what we call sleep hygiene, sleep diary, will give valuable information as to why sleep is so elusive but psychologically, it is incredibly important for mental health. Last question. Personal management. I'm 21 years old and I have Asperger's syndrome. In some situations, I seem to have no problem thinking clearly, but in others, I feel very confused and I'm unable to think. For example, if I start off the morning studying physics, that's all I can think about for the rest of the day. <laughs> But then as soon as I try to switch to doing something else, I'm totally confused. I'm stupid. I'm overwhelmed. It seems like whatever I do first in the morning, I have to do for the rest of the day, or I get extremely confused and anxious. Can you please help me understand what is happening and why? The question related to a thought that dominates the rest of the day, I would add it's the waking emotion too that may dominate the rest of the day. It's almost a one-track mind that once you're on that track, it's very difficult to get off it. There's a determination to pursue something until there's a natural closure in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And when you have any diversity in trying any other activity, the mind is saying, no, I will really want to focus on that. Mm -hmm. Now, in certain situations, that single-minded determination in a job is going to be fantastic because you're mm -hmm. really going to get the job done. Mm -hmm. But when you have multiple responsibilities of the juggling of various things, that's going to be a real source of frustration. Mm -hmm. Now, the person is describing a situation where they have to do other things. Mm -hmm. Now, it may well be that there needs to be a better transition to recalibrate the mind and mentally actually thinking, okay, out of physics, I've now got to do car washing or <laughs> shopping or whatever it is that I need to do and almost saying, okay, body, get yourself ready. Imagine yourself doing it. And then the brain goes, okay, off we go. Is a physical change possibly helpful as well? Just getting up and moving, mm -hmm. turning on the TV, taking a shower. We're talking here about the ASD difficulties with change and transition. It can be a walk around the block, listening to music. It's just something that acts as a transition because to just quickly switch from one to the other, to recalibrate the mind, is difficult. Walking, rhythm, would be a good one if you can. Meditation would be another one. So those are the sorts of things to help transition.